All right, I would like to welcome you all to another virtual Whitman event. I am Jennifer Northam, class of 1991, and a member of the alumni relations team for the last seven years. Before we get started, I'd like to share a few quick updates from Walla Walla. Students have been arriving back to campus in waves, starting with athletes and finishing up with our first years on their first trip to campus for some of them this weekend. Our 1800 students, faculty and staff are getting their first of two COVID tests to set a baseline for the community. And it's been all hands on deck with dozens of staff volunteers ensuring the safety and efficiency of the process. Athletes arrived first so that all of our teams could have time to quarantine and practice together for a shortened season. Basketball and swimming will kick off on Friday the 22nd and Saturday the 23rd. Their games and meets will be streamed online. You can always check those at athletics.whitman.edu. After two weeks of quarantine and a week of strictly online classes, in-person hybrid classes are scheduled to begin on Monday, February 1st. Keep an eye on the college social media channels uh, for scenes from this cautious start to the spring semester. For more information, you can view the Safe Start plan for campus on the college website, as usual, whitman.edu. But that brings me to the man of the hour. It's my pleasure to introduce Steve McConnell, class of 1985. He's been a leading expert in software estimation, software measurement, and software engineering practices for more than 20 years. He's best known as an author for several software industry classics and is the CEO of Constructs Software. He is currently contributing to the CDC's COVID-19 forecast ensemble model and shares that work on his COVID Complete Data Center website. At Whitman, Steve was a philosophy major with a double minor of mathematics and computer science. More recently, he's done volunteering for the college, uh, serving as part of governing board working groups on student life and exploring the addition of computer science as a major which was successful in the fall of 2017. In a moment, I'll turn the screen over to Steve and he'll talk for, with us for about 45 minutes and then we'll open up the floor for questions. I'll keep everyone's microphones muted until then. You can submit questions in the chat feature if you have a thought as Steve is speaking, uh, or you can turn on your camera and I'll invite you to unmute your microphone to ask your question in person when his comments are done. This event is being recorded and will be posted on the virtual Whitman webpage in the next week or so. And I'd like to now turn everything over to Steve. All right, thank you. Uh, I realize that I have been messing around with my computer and I should have checked my microphone, but it looks like I'm okay. So yeah, thanks for the nice introduction. Um, uh, I think that the, the relevant question here is why would you, why would anyone want to attend a talk from a philosophy major about pandemic forecasting? I think that's a fair question. Um, I'm, as you, as Jennifer mentioned in the introduction, I'm best known as the author of Code Complete, which is a book about very detailed software development practices. But my interest in better software development practices really started with the topic of a uh, much later book, Software Estimation. And there's, there probably is a pretty obvious connection between the topic of estimation and forecasting. And what uh, one of the things I commented on in the book was that experts tend to use simple estimation strategies, even when their level of expertise in the subject they're estimating is high. And this seemed to be the case with uh, forecast for COVID-19, especially early on, uh, or at least that's the way it looked from the outside. It looks a little bit different from the inside, but from the outside, it looked like the forecasts were really not very reliable. I was doing essentially paper and pencil or really uh, low tech spreadsheet forecasts that were doing about as well, or in many cases, much better than the forecasts that were being reported. Uh, and so I just became more and more uh, interested in it and dived into it deeper. And uh, like a lot of people, I suppose I have a little bit more time on my hands because of the stay at home orders and so on. So this just was something I found interesting. Uh, so the result of this has been that uh, I feel like based on my background in software estimation, I have been able to contribute pretty accurate forecasts. Uh, this is a chart that shows the, uh, the uh, point forecast, meaning the most likely single number forecast 
for the four week period ending uh, as of Saturday. Um, CDC weeks go from Sunday to Saturday. So this is the normal uh, reporting period. Uh, my forecast model is called COVID complete. And uh, according to this, what we really wanna do is be centered on the line in the middle and as narrow around that line as possible. And so uh, for the four week period that just ended, my forecast model uh, was actually the most accurate out of about 34 models contributing. Uh, we also have uh, what are called prediction interval forecasts or range forecasts. When you hear the phrase 95% likely or 95% prediction interval, normally you hear the phrase 95% confidence interval, which is actually not a correct usage of that term, but I think everybody knows what's meant by it. Uh, so by that standard, uh, for the most recent four week period, my model uh, was second most accurate out of 34 models. And then for the national forecast, I didn't do quite as well, but I did come in third place. Uh, and the error from my model over a four week period was 2% for that uh, four week period. Uh, the best model was only off by 1%, but uh, I, was, I was right in the hunt. Uh, so really uh, the point is just, uh, if you wanna know why you should uh, tend to talk by a philosophy uh, guy, uh, it's because I've gotten really up to my eyeballs in the forecasting, and I think there's been some interesting, have been some interesting learnings about this, uh, which I hope to share with you uh, this afternoon. Uh, so what I'd like to talk about this afternoon is, first of all, why, why do we even want to forecast? What's the point? What do we get out of it? Uh, talk a little bit about how forecasting works in general. Uh, talk about some issues with COVID-19 data, which has been a really big deal in terms of uh, coming up with accurate forecasts for the pandemic, and uh, then uh, describe some of the inner workings of the CDC forecasts, uh, which I'm contributing to, and then uh, finish by uh, showing how accurate some of these forecasts are and what some of the limitations are. So the first topic then of why forecast uh, really breaks down into two parts. Why would we forecast at the national level and why would we forecast at the state level? At the national level, uh, the kinds of forecasts that are coming out of the CDC are, for the most part, forecasts with a one to four week horizon. And so this really guides near term activity and event planning. Uh, it provides, I think most significantly, it provides important context for the state level uh, decisions. So if we are overwhelmed at the national level, that doesn't give us a lot of capacity to flex into supporting individual states. If we have more capacity to spare at the national level, that implies we have more capacity to help individual states that are having problems. And so the national level forecast really is important for setting context. Uh, I think it's also useful for avoiding panic, but I think what we've seen with some organizations is that they're actually using the forecast to create panic. And uh, that's one of the reasons I got involved in this in the first place was some of the, the claims people were making uh, just seemed outlandish and I could do a back of the envelope calculation and see that it just didn't make any sense. For example, there was a physician on my uh, neighborhood next door feed who was making the claim that the fatality rate from COVID-19 was 10,000 times as high as the flu. Well, the fatality rate from the flu is about one in a thousand. So there's no way that the fatality rate could be one in, uh, could be 10,000 times as high. That's more than 100% of the people dying from it. But those were the kind of claims that were circulating. At the state level forecasting, uh, I think the, the motivations are very similar, uh, but I think in some ways they're more important. They certainly can be used to guide near-term activity planning and event planning in that one to four week range. We've seen pretty clearly that the, that the, uh, uh, the virus doesn't respect state boundaries, but it does seem to affect regions at a time. And that really just has to do with people traveling and, and sharing the virus with each other. Uh, and so by focusing on state forecasts, we can actually identify states that are going to need uh, extra support, extra supplies, extra medical staff. And that one to four week horizon is actually a meaningful horizon for moving equipment and, and people around the country if we need to. You know, for example, you might remember early in the pandemic, Washington State decided that we had more ventilators than we needed, and so we sent a bunch of ventilators to New York City. It turned out they didn't need them, but that's the kind of thing that we can do if we have meaningful uh, state-level forecasts. I want to say a few words about forecasting versus speculation because they're, they're clearly not the same thing, but I think we see a lot of speculations treated as though they were on the same footing or as, as meaningful as forecasts. Uh, so 
what we saw back in September was something I think that's kind of extraordinary, which is that uh, Nicholas Reich, uh, who's the head of Reich Labs, which is the, the group that's in charge of the CDC uh, COVID-19 forecasting, uh, wrote an article that was published in the Washington Post where he came out and directly criticized IHME for its sensationalistic and I think, I think unfounded forecasts. Uh, and he, I think the fact that he was criticizing them publicly was quite extraordinary, but he made a very strong point that we can forecast meaningfully on a one to four week horizon, but once we get longer than about four weeks, then we really aren't forecasting. We're really just more guessing. We're creating scenarios and that's about the extent of it. Uh, so the difference really is that when we're forecasting, we were using inputs that are known and we're calculating the outputs based on relationships that are also known to the inputs that are known. When we're speculating, we're typically guessing about the inputs and the outputs are basically guesses piled on top of other guesses. And to make that really specific, uh, if we were gonna forecast some of the knowns that we can make use of is we can know the number of people who have already tested positive. Uh, we can know an approximate relationship between positive tests which is one thing, and the number of people who are actually infected or cases, which is a different thing. Uh, we can know the approximate fatality status uh, by age and comorbidity status, and we can know how long it takes for the virus to progress. So these are some of the things that we can know. Uh, the kinds of things that we don't really know that really constitute or qualify more as guesses are like specific policies that specific states might or might not implement at some undetermined point in the future. Uh, the note we can guess at the effectiveness of the policy, policies based on some assumption about whether the compliance is good or not so good or somewhere in the middle. Uh, uh, we can, we have now, this slide is actually needs to be updated, but uh, six months ago we were guessing about when the vaccines might be available. Uh, and I think there's still some open question about how effective the vaccines are, especially as we start talking about whether people are actually getting the second dose and whether they're getting it in a timely way and what percentage of people actually, you know, do get that second dose at the time they need it. So basically, if we're, uh, if we're uh, forecasting, we're going to make use of things that are known. The more we start making assumptions or, you know, educated guesses about things that aren't really known, the more we're moving into the realm of speculation. So with forecasting, really what's possible is one to four week time horizons. We can come up with pretty accurate national forecasts. And here, I'm really throughout the talk, I'm speaking mainly about uh, death forecasts. And we can come up with uh, state forecasts that are somewhat less accurate than the national forecasts. And uh, for the bigger states where there's a lot more activity, we tend to do a better job of forecasting those. Uh, for the smaller states, uh, which there are numerous issues with smaller states or less active states, uh, but just the math doesn't work out as well on the smaller states. And so those have been more, uh, more uh, error prone. So I'd like to turn now just to the topic of, in general, how forecasting works. And uh, uh, in particular, I'm gonna just basically show you what I'm doing, at least a little bit of what I'm doing. It, it clearly starts with what we know. And some of the things we know are quite different now than they were a year ago. And I think I start with uh, knowing what the timing of the disease looks like. Uh, and basically we know that if someone gets infected, let's call that day zero, that uh, on average contagiousness begins around day two, you know, plus or minus on all these numbers, but contagiousness begins about day two symptoms, if any, show up somewhere between four and five days. And I say if any, because about half the people appear to be completely asymptomatic. So showing symptoms is not something that happens all the time. It happens about half the time. Uh, and then a person gets a test and that uh, has happened at around day five. So five days after the infection. I'll come back to that uh, relationship in a minute. Around day 11, contagiousness ends. Uh, and one of the things that is an important initiative that hopefully we will get to more as time goes by is ideally we would really like to shrink that time between when contagiousness begins and when testing occurs so that we can identify uh, the people who are actually contagious. Uh, and ideally, we would like people to be tested before contagiousness begins. So that means on day two or day one, uh, the only way we get there is through active contact tracing where people 
know or are told that they've come in contact with someone who's infected, that can that means they could uh, realize that they are that they are potentially infected, you know, potentially as early as day zero, maybe day one. Uh, we don't have to wait until day five uh, with active contact tracing, but that's maybe a topic for a different day, at least to go into in detail. Uh, on average, it takes about 18 days from infection uh, until someone dies, if they're going to die, or if they're going to recover, it takes about 21 days until they have enough antibodies that you can test for them. And at that point, about 95% of the people show antibodies uh, if, they're, if they're ever going to. Um, now, I should say, of course, there's variability in all of this. There's some kind of probability distributions around it. Uh, people don't take exactly two days to become contagious. They don't take exactly 11 days to run through the contagiousness period. But for forecasting purposes, that variability matters only a little bit. The fact that we know what the averages, uh, averages are is actually the thing that, that we count on. And so because we uh, know these relationships, we can draw some inferences such as uh, the period from infection to death averages about 18 days, and that becomes useful for forecasting purposes. Uh, the period from infection to antibody development of 21 days is pretty useful for analysis purposes, in, in particular figuring out what the real, uh, the real death rate is. Uh, the idea that contagiousness lasts about nine days is a good thing to know, especially in terms of how long do people need to stay uh, away from everyone else. Uh, you know, here I think we're not going to just use the average of nine days because we want a little bit of a safety margin to make sure people don't go back out in public while they might still be contagious. Uh, but the idea that we would have them quarantined for three weeks or something like that doesn't really make sense because we know that on average the contagiousness is much shorter than that. Uh, we know the period from test to death has been uh, a moving target over the course of the pandemic. One of the things that's happened is we uh, have had a pattern of testing sooner as the pandemic has progressed, and that's widened the period from uh, test to death. So back in uh, April, May timeframe, it was really averaging about 12 days, as far as I could tell. Now it's averaging about 15 days, as far as I can tell. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's another interesting point for forecasting purposes is we're trying to track or uh, forecast deaths based on test results, that, that gap ends up being a, a key, key point. Uh, and then the period from test to the end of contagiousness is about six days. And I think this is really kind of a, a sore and sad point, which is if you go back to the April, May timeframe when people were waiting quite a long time to get tested, and then they were waiting more days before they got their test results, we actually had a pretty likely scenario where if you got your test results, by the time you actually had waited to get tested and waited to get your test results, you probably weren't contagious anymore. And so we had this kind of crazy situation where a pot, we, we totally didn't interpret it that way. We then at that point would put someone into quarantine for two weeks or longer. But I think that as we now understand the relationships, given the, the, the slow uh, slowness of, with which that was happening at the time, uh, there was a kind of strange relationship there. All right, and then the other point I need to make here is that everything I've been talking about is not really so much about when these events occur in reality, but more about when they get reported. And that's a really key distinction because what we're really saying is um, that uh, the, the gap between um, the testing and the death is not so much the gap between becoming positive, but it's the gap between when the test result is reported and when the death is reported, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a few minutes. So why, why does all this, what does all this have to do with forecasting? Well, at least for the way that I approach it, uh, if we know uh, the relationships between these different uh, uh, events, then we can take the test number, which we know occurs on a certain date, those get reported, and we can apply what we've learned about the ratio of positive tests to deaths uh, and at that point, we can forecast that that number of deaths are going to occur uh, approximately 14 days later. And at the national level, just because we have so many states contributing, in statistics, there's this property called the central limit theorem that basically says you put a whole bunch of distribu probability distributions together, they end up looking like a bell curve. And because the states vary a lot, that's what we get at the national level. And we end up being able to forecast this with quite a bit of accuracy. 
Uh, at the state level, not it's a little bit more problematic because uh, there just aren't as many highs and lows canceling each other out. Uh, but we can also project this forward for another 14 days after the first 14 days, just because the trends don't seem to change that quickly. We don't have cases where a state runs up a lot of cases and then they abruptly stop uh, or they you know, start to climb the, the number of people in the hospital and so on, and then it abruptly stops. It, it eases up or speeds up and then it comes back down. And so there's definitely a, a curve shape to that as well. All right. Uh, so I want to spend a couple minutes talking about the, the role of data anomalies in forecasting. And just for somebody who wants to read and under, you know, read the news or watch the news and understand what's what you're being told, I think understanding the number of anomalies and the, the kinds of anomalies is pretty important to even understanding what's being reported and how to interpret it. And then that feeds into forecasting as well. So the first point I think is really important, that positive tests and cases are not the same thing. Uh, we see near universal reporting on every network and practically every write-up you read that treats positive test numbers as if it was the number of infections. And this has not even been close to true for the entire course of the pandemic. To put a fine point on it, this chart shows uh, in the, the red area is the deaths, number of deaths, and that number is on the right axis. I'm not going to talk about that right now. Uh, the blue area is the number of positive tests. That's uh, uh, the numbers for that are shown on the left axis. So if we go back to uh, April, we were running about 30,000 positive tests per day. Right now, we're running about 250,000 positive tests per day. And so that would imply that we have eight times as many people getting sick if positive tests and cases were the same thing. But uh, you know, does anything else confirm that? Well, if we look at the ratio of deaths rather than uh, tests, what we see now is that we've got about 1.65 times as many deaths per day as we had back in April. So no, we don't have eight times as many people getting sick every day as we did in April. We have about 1.65 times as many. And that's because positive tests have been uh, extremely variable proxy for the number of people who are actually getting infected and the ratio of people who, the ratio of tests to actual infections has changed a lot uh, over, the, over the course of the pandemic. And if you just think about uh, how difficult it was to get tested back in April, May, June, you know that testing was really limited and of course we were testing a smaller percentage of people who are actually sick. The amount of testing now is just mind blowing. Uh, we are running about 1.6 million total tests per day. It's 11 and a half million per week. We're testing about three and a half percent of the US population every week. So just a staggering amount of testing. And uh, that's just so far beyond what we were doing in the spring that there's really no comparison. We're just we're picking up a far, far higher percentage of people who are actually sick. Um, so early in the pandemic, uh, it looked like there were about 10 to 20 cases or infections per positive test. Now it looks like there's more like three to five cases per positive test. And so as we see these references to positive test numbers, especially comparisons over time, they're, they're virtually meaningless. Uh, you have to put a lot of, of uh, of uh, conditions on any, any comparison like that. Second data quality issue is holidays. Uh, we've had this recurring pattern of uh, agencies under-reporting through the holiday period and then over-reporting or backfilling afterwards. And we're seeing that right now, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but if we go, so now I am going to talk about that pink area that shows deaths. And if you look at this pink area, you'll notice, I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but you'll notice uh, some divots in, in uh, the graph. Well, those divots don't have to do with fewer people dying. It has to do with fewer people being reported as dying and then backfilling later. So we see this pattern of a divot and then a little bit of a spike afterwards. And so this was Labor Day weekend. And then we saw the same thing in Thanksgiving where we have, Thanksgiving's actually a little hard to interpret, but it looked like because it was Thanksgiving's not on a Saturday or Sunday, like there might've been some acceleration of reporting. Uh, so people were finishing up paperwork before they left for the holiday. And then the dip might've occurred at least partially afterwards. 
Uh, Christmas, wow, look at the dip there. I mean, that's just, you know, enormous. That dip has caused all kinds of problems for meaningful forecasting in the period uh, since then. And then New Year's is also kind of a, a, a little bit of a, a minor version of that. So it kind of looks like the real pattern over this over this period is look more like the dashed line here, but the reported pattern doesn't. And if you look at the, the you kind of mentally fill in the pink area above the line into the, the gaps below the line, those are approximately equal. Uh, but what this says is it's really problematic if you just take the data at face value, you really have to take a look at, at what the mismatch is between the reporting of the data and what was really going on on the ground. And now that I've laid a little bit of groundwork, you can also see I first got bit by this back on Memorial Day. You can't really see the dip in the Memorial Day data, but you can see the backfilling spike afterwards. And so um, that was that actually uh, was the first time I saw it and it, that affected my forecast that I made uh, on the basis of the data that week. So holidays are an issue. Positive tests versus cases is an issue. Another issue is day of the week. So, um, We've, we've seen this over the course of the pandemic. This is uh, daily test and death data from Pennsylvania. Uh, if you look here on the left side of the graph, we've got these big red spikes. So those represent high numbers of deaths reported on, on individual days. Did that many people die on those days and a much smaller numbers of people die on the other days? Of course not. That's just how they reported the data. So this week uh, or last week, we had news reporting that there were 4,000 deaths in one day for the first time on January 7th. Well, is that really true? Well, January 7th was a Thursday. And we know from looking at this that in terms of the underreporting and overreporting, over Thursdays are overreported by 25%. So typically on Thursdays, they report 125% of what actually happened. Um, and so really, no, we didn't have 4,000 deaths on January 7th. We probably had more like 3,200. Uh, but just the way the data gets reported makes it look like there are these spikes, and then that creates something that seems newsworthy. So uh, you know, we should expect to continue to see that kind of that kind of reporting. Um, other data issues: some states don't report on Saturdays. Lots of states don't report on Sundays. Washington State doesn't report on Sundays, for example. Uh, so when we get into state-level forecasts at the national level, it evens out a little bit. At the state level, depending on what your state you're looking at, it doesn't even out at all. We've also had states that are just overwhelmed uh, by the amount of work that's required here and their staff is just not able to keep up. We've had issues with states recategorizing prior data in big chunks, like uh, New Jersey and New York added 3,500 deaths on one day. So that kind of uh, uh, undermines your, your basis for forecasting. And then sometimes they just make mistakes. I don't think there's bad faith here, but it's just you know, people are overwhelmed. And so we get reports where they mix antibody positive test results with the virus uh, positive test results and stuff like that that just really makes the data foundation for forecasting really shaky. Uh, and this has been really going on for the entire pandemic. Early in the pandemic, the issue is more spotty data reporting, just incomplete data reporting. As time has gone by, we've got backfilling and corrections, and we constantly have to go back and forth and re-examine what we think the data means. So um, COVID-19 forecasting at the CDC uh, looks like this. The work is overseen by a team in Reich Lab in uh, University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Uh, there are about 35 modeling groups. The number has, has varied over the course of the pandemic and it's fairly high now compared to what it was a few months ago. Uh, different groups submit forecasts in a particular way, and those are combined into what's called the ensemble model, uh, which is essentially the official forecast from the CDC. Uh, forecasts are submitted weekly on Mondays. Uh, they're submitted via GitHub, which is a technical tool that as a software person I was familiar with, and uh, in this case, it's really used to submit data more than um, software code. Uh, the data is all public. Anyone who wants to can go in and access it has to be submitted in a very specific format. And to be included in the ensemble model, you need to generate about 10,000 forecast records per week uh, per team to participate. So that's what I've been doing for the last six months. Uh, there are numerous kinds of forecasts submitted. There's point forecasts or most likely. Uh, the mathematical term is prediction interval quantiles, but if you hear 
95% uh, likely range. That's what that refers to. Uh, team submit forecast both for cases or positive tests, really, uh, deaths. Uh, for, uh, forecasts are submitted for 50, 50 states plus DC plus territories, and also an overall US national uh, forecast. And then these are submitted on one, two, three, and four week time horizons. <clears throat> I'll give you a second to look at the forecast teams here. So probably more than half the teams are from universities. And if you look at the, the names of these universities, we've got some really, really well-respected institutions here. We've got Carnegie Mellon, John Hopkins, Harvard, uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, MIT. I mean, the list really goes on and on. Uh, we have a handful of research labs, and then we have a handful of individuals and firms. And then I would be in the category of individuals and firms. The interesting thing about this is the best forecasts are not coming from the places that you, you would think they were. Uh, the better forecasts are mostly coming from individuals and teams, uh, individuals and firms, and a couple of the universities are doing pretty well, but for the most part, the universities are, are surprisingly um, not effective. There's a weekly call uh, hosted by the CDC that the forecast teams participate in. And I have to say that I found it somewhat uh, dismaying to participate in these calls because a lot of the academic conversation is really, a, you would think that we didn't, we weren't in the middle of a forecast now and that everyone was preparing or rather in the middle of a pandemic now and that everyone was preparing to fight the next pandemic instead of this one, there doesn't seem to be much awareness that this is the once in a hundred year pandemic that we're in the middle of right now. And, and that I'd say was an attitude more on the part of the, the academic institutions, the individuals and the consulting firms, I think are the ones that are really, really taking it more seriously and more urgently. Uh, I said I was gonna talk about forecast models. So I'll talk about that briefly. Uh, some of you have probably read about the SEIR models, which stands for Susceptible, Exposed, Infected, and Recovered. This was the established epidemiological approach going into the pandemic. One of the interesting findings for me about participating in these Tuesday calls is that I think in a lot of ways, the teams that had established models for, say, modeling flu outbreaks, in the end, they actually have been disadvantaged by having those models because they've basically had to unwind numerous assumptions that are mistaken. Whereas people like me that started with nothing, we don't have to correct bad assumptions to start with. Uh, we just start by trying to build something uh, from scratch. And so it's interesting how much time it's taken for the people who really ought to you know, be the ones who are able to create the more accurate forecast to actually unwind assumptions that don't quite apply to the situation and, and improve their forecasts. Uh, we've got teams with massive data sets. Carnegie Mellon has a data set of over 500 million records. Uh, teams using fairly esoteric data like mobility data from cell phone records. Those forecasts have been in general quite poor. Uh, Notre Dame, which is using that approach is consistently the least accurate uh, week after week. And then we've got teams using machine learning, artificial intelligence, and various statistical approaches. Uh, the best approach so far has really been based on the model that I described of uh, having a simple model that's based on positive tests and a lag from positive tests to death. Uh, the majority of the more accurate models are using this simple approach, and that applies to both individuals and uh, the academic teams. The team at University of Massachusetts at Amherst, which is where Reich Labs is based, is using that approach too. And they're one of the university teams that's, uh, that's doing pretty accurate work. Uh, J. Scott Armstrong commented in Principles of Forecasting 20 years ago that one of the most enduring and useful conclusions from research on forecasting is that simple methods are generally as accurate as complex methods. I quoted that in my software estimation book. Uh, and it's been interesting to me to see that it applies in this case to forecasting at least of a a novel coronavirus or a new, a new disease, maybe not so much to uh, something like the flu where we have lots of experience, but it does seem to apply in this context. All right, so let's turn to uh, looking at how much accuracy we're really getting with these forecasts. I'll start with the national forecast and then, uh, and then look at the state forecast and then we'll wrap up. So this is the chart that I showed you toward the beginning of the, of the talk uh, that gives the 
national fatality forecast for the four-week period that just ended. Um, and the best forecast here was within 1% for a four-week period. I would say the best forecast is often within 1% for one, two, three, and four-week periods. Uh, but it's not to say that the same model is usually the best. Uh, the models definitely trade off for uh, who's best. It just happened to work out that for this particular period, my model ended up being uh, pretty good. It's not always the case. Uh, the ensemble model, the, it's interesting, the ensemble model is almost never the best, but it's very rare that it's poor. And so essentially, the ensemble model performs well over time due to consistency, uh, not so much due to the fact that it has standout performance in any given week. And in fact, that totally makes sense because the ensemble model is literally the average of the other forecasts. They started out using the mean, they've shifted to using the median, but that's it. It's a straight median of the forecasts that meet the data submission criteria. It's been kind of surprising to me that that approach has worked as well as it has. So we've got in this sample, we've got a little under half of the models that were within 10% uh, for the period. It's not always that accurate, but uh, we usually have quite a few models that are within 10% which I think is a pretty practical level of accuracy for uh, what we need to determine national capacity on a four-week horizon. Uh, are we, do we have spare capacity that we can move to different areas and that kind of thing? Uh, going back to the four-week period that ended on uh, Christmas Day, uh, which was a Saturday, uh, you see the, the players are a little bit different here. Um, and I'd say that uh, in this case, the best model was off by 4%. Uh, the ensemble model was off by more uh, in this instance, largely due to the fact that there weren't any overestimates. It was all underestimates and just the way the ensemble is created, it can't help but get dragged down by where the, the center of gravity of the models is. Um, and we only had a handful of models in this case, less than about maybe less than 20% that were within 10%, but we still had several. Uh, and uh, that's really been the case uh, for virtually any period that we've had. Uh, looking at it over a longer horizon, I realize this is kind of an eye chart. I'm happy to make the slides available in PDF form if anybody wants to see them later. Uh, but this shows a much longer, uh, uh, a much larger slice of the data. So this represents a maximum of 84 forecasts uh, from August 3rd to January 4th. Um, and you can see that we have uh, the best model is averaging 7% uh, error, and 100% of that model's forecasts have been within 25% of actual for that period. So that's pretty darn good consistency. Um, uh, my model has averaged error 9%, and 96% of the forecasts have been within 25%, so not quite the best, but pretty close. Uh, the ensemble model is also right in there, very similar to mine, uh, average error of 9%. 90% of the forecasts are within 20%. So we've got about 10 models that have an average error less than 10%. Um, the USC model is the only one that really has some significant outliers. The others are pretty much staying within that 25% error margin basically all the time. And, uh, and uh, so for national point forecasts, I think we've got really pretty good accuracy just with the point forecasts or the most likely forecasts. The teams, including mine, submit prediction interval or range forecasts, but from my point of view, they're not really needed because the point forecasts are accurate enough. I don't really see what we gain by having a prediction interval. And a lot of teams submit very wide prediction intervals. If we go back and look, the, the, uh, the light blue bars are the team's prediction intervals. Uh, and so really, they're so close in general, a lot of them anyway, with the, uh, the point forecast that the, the size of the prediction intervals, I think, actually gives a really misleading idea about how much uncertainty we're really dealing with. And unfortunately, the main way that uh, the ensemble model is publicized <clears throat> makes it look like there's vast amount of uncertainty every week, and there really isn't. Uh, really, you can pretty much count on uh, the, the results coming out, in most cases, within 10% of whatever the ensemble forecast is. So the exact ranking of the models varies a lot depending on what period is selected, even over a long time. Like if I chose a different set of dates, not starting on August 3rd, if I started a month later, you'd see a little bit of shifting about who's number one, number two, number three. 
Um, but I think we've got enough data now that the top 10 models are really pretty consistent. Uh, you know, they trade off being which one's best and which one might have a problem in one particular week. But I think any of those could serve as an accurate basis for national uh, coronavirus forecasting. So let's take a look at state forecasts for a minute. Um, uh, the state forecasts are more challenging because the number of tests, positive tests, deaths, and uh, the ability to estimate cases from tests is, is more limited. The data is definitely rougher. Uh, you know, when a state adds a bunch of data that it wants to backfill, that is very problematic for trying to figure out what to do with that state. States don't always tell you they're doing that. You just have to, to notice it. Uh, it's one of the advantages of the Tuesday calls is that various teams notice different things and so they'll, um, you know, they'll inform each other. Um, for that reason, I think the states that are bigger, uh, you know, if you look at New York's data, their data looks like very smooth curves. If you look at Wyoming's data, there's no, nothing that looks like a curve in Wyoming's data. There just aren't enough data points. Uh, the, 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 the problem here is that accurate forecasting at the state level, in my opinion, is possibly more important than forecasting at the national level. The national level, considered on its own, we're really just saying, well, you know, how sad should we be in a way? But at the state level, we actually have some practical issues like, does a state need help? Does it need to pull resources from a neighboring state? Or uh, do, do, do people need to get involved at the national level to try to support that state? Um, so just to give you a handful of examples of different states, and there's really no rhyme or reason to this other than these are the ones I happen to be looking at. So Oklahoma for the four week period that just finished, the average error for Oklahoma was 20%. You know, my model happened to do pretty well for, for Oklahoma for this period, definitely not always the case. Um, for California for the four week period that just ended, the average error was 35%. My model didn't do nearly so well uh, in California for that period. So my error was higher than average for, for California. Uh, Florida, uh, for whatever reason, the average error for Florida was uh, 17%, so that's lower. Um, here, my model did pretty well again. Uh, but we go to Hawaii. Hawaii has been really problematic throughout the pandemic, I think partly because the numbers are pretty small. But the average error in Hawaii for this period is 58%. So basically, we're not getting a lot of value out of the forecast with that error level. And here, I was right in the middle of the pack. So my point in highlighting my model here is really just to say that you know some models tend to do better than others but the fact that a model does tends to do better than others for any given forecast especially at the state level really all bets are off and it's really hard to predict which model is going to do well uh, week to week at the state level uh, so in terms of the, the forecasts are more challenging evaluating the forecast is also more challenging just because there is so much more variability um, so uh, we really need to look at two things here. If I kind of focus on my model, we want to look at the point forecast and how accurate it was. And I think at the state level, because the point forecasts are nowhere near as reliable as they are at the national level, the prediction intervals actually become a lot more meaningful. At the national level, I don't see big value add there, but at the state level, um, definitely do. So this is uh, just a tool that I use for my own purposes. Uh, and this shows uh, basically my models, uh, prediction intervals are the light blue bars. My models point forecasts are the dark blue points. And then the red rectangles are the actual value. I'm a fairly visual person, or at least I like to understand things. It's easier for me to understand things presented visually. So for me to be able to scan this and just say, OK, look, you know, I was a little bit low in Arizona. I was a lot low in California. I was pretty good, really, uh, up until New York, I was a little bit low, but not that bad. Pennsylvania, a little bit. So you know, overall, this was one of my more successful sets of forecasts. Um, and, uh, and I find this way of, represent, of representing it fairly useful. If we want to look at the overall team's sets of forecasts, then we look at them like this. And uh, this is, again, the chart that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. And what this does is, the ideal set of forecasts would have a super tight cluster right on that black line in the middle. And so my set for this period actually happened to be quite good. That's, that's um, 
pretty close to ideal, really. We don't we don't see a lot of teams doing better than that. And I certainly don't do that well uh, most periods, but I happen to for this one. We get out here to the right, and this in this example, this is University of Texas. You know, this is far from ideal. Um, their uh, median error is about 35%, um, which is pretty high. And if we look at the this range here, is the it's called the interquartile range, but it's the 25th percentile to the 75th percentile. So they've only cut, they've got 75% of their forecasts that are high. So pretty strong error tendency toward uh, overestimating. Um, so this is kind of the general way that we look at this. And there's a whole bunch of math behind this, but we won't go into that. Uh, for the prediction interval forecasts, I think one of the interesting things that is kind of surprising to me is that the teams are, are forecasting numerous prediction intervals. We forecast the the inner 10%, the 50%, 95%, 99%, et cetera. But the main ones I look at is the 95% the 95 prediction interval. And I guess I've been quite surprised at how poor the teams are at getting to the goal of 95% capture rate. Ideally, we would have every model pretty close to or above this 95% capture rate line. Uh, but we don't. We have nearly all of the teams missing that goal, and many of them missing it by a lot. And this goes back to the point of some of the these institutions here you'd expect to be doing a lot better. Notre Dame, they're only capturing 15%, and they're supposed to be capturing 95%. Uh, UCLA, about 22%. Uh, MIT, 10%. You know, Going into this, I would I would have thought that a lot of these organizations would be doing vastly better than they are. Johns Hopkins, they actually have three different teams contributing, so this is the worst. So it's not really a fair representation. They're better better forecasts are up here for this period, um, but still, you know, 65 percent when you're supposed to be capturing 95 percent, not not great. Um, Carnegie Mellon, same thing. Um, so. Anyway, I think this is kind of interesting. Well, I think it's very interesting. That's why I spend so much time on it. Uh, but we have a lot of teams that are basically using super narrow ranges. They're not capturing very much. And they're actually, I think, doing quite a disservice because they're not really presenting a clear picture of what our level of certainty really is about the forecast that they're presenting. You present a 95% uh, prediction interval. It's supposed to capture 95%. It conveys a message that we're pretty sure the answer is in this range. But for most of these forecasts, the answer is not in that range. They missed by a lot. Um, so bottom line here is that the better models are within 25%, a little more than half the time across the states. You know, 50 to 60% of the time, typically. Uh, on the range forecast or prediction interval forecast, I think these are necessary just because the point forecasts are, are a lot more hit or miss than they are at the national level. We have a, a small number of models that are consistently capturing in the 90 to 95% actual uh, of actual values and with reasonably narrow ranges. The goal here is not to say my forecast is zero to a million and then I capture 100%. The goal here is to use the narrowest range we can and still capture the target of 95%. And so we do have a couple of teams that are basically literally, they're not literally saying zero to a million but they're literally, literally using zero as the bottom end of their forecast for every range. You know, the nominal forecast would be 2000 and the bottom end of the range is still zero, uh, which again is kind of surprising to me. Okay, so summarize. Um, I think it's clear that accurate forecasts are possible on a one to four week horizon, more so at the national level than at the state level, but to some degree at the national, at the state level too, especially with the prediction interval forecasts uh, coming from certain teams. Uh, some of the private in the best forecasts really are coming from private individuals. Um, kind of surprised at the performance of some of the the, uh, the universities involved. And I think the good news here is that the CDC's ensemble model is consistently, not consistently the best, but it's consistently among the best. And its real strength is its consistently, is its consistency where it might not be the best, but it's it's virtually never the worst. And uh, uh, if you're interested in following up in more detail, I've got this uh, COVID complete data center. Uh, it has forecasts, my forecast for the one to four week horizons for state and national level. 
It's got lots and lots of evaluations for all the models uh, that contribute to the ensemble model. Uh, it has data all in the form of graphs on the current state of the pandemic nationally and state by state. Uh, I have scorecards for each state so you can check out what Washington state looks like if you're interested or if you're calling in from another state, you can check that out. Um, I update everything every couple of days. Um, these are some links, so if uh, anyone gets the PDF, you can uh, easily get the links, but the ensemble model stuff is all readily available, so if you're curious in seeing more of what's that about, uh, there are some links here that you can check out. And I think at this point, I will uh, turn the mic back over to Jennifer and see what kind of questions we have. Excellent. Thank you so much, Steve. Do you want to uh, turn off screen sharing and then that way we can see people's faces if they'd like to turn on cameras and microphones for questions? Yeah. Right. Uh, one online question to start. How effective are the models in predicting impacts of various interventions? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, that, that topic comes up every week in the calls. And, and it's, it's one of those things where intuitively you would think that the more kinds of adjustments that teams make on the forecast, if they say, oh, you know, we're expecting people to travel for Thanksgiving or travel for Christmas and we'll make an adjustment for that. People are starting to get vaccinated and so we'll make an adjustment for that. There's nothing in the evaluation data that says that those sorts of adjustments improve accuracy. And I think you know, one of the things that happens with the models is there are some teams that are always high in their forecasts and some teams that are always low in their forecasts. I think what that says is that their worldview is that things are going to get better or their worldview is things mm -hmm. are falling apart. And so what we see is that as the pandemic itself goes up and down, teams that are always high, when the pandemic goes up, they look like they're right for a while. But then the pandemic goes down and they're still high. And then the team that was always low looks right for a while. So we see a lot of instances of a stopped clock being right twice a day with the various forecast teams. And there aren't that many teams that are really more neutral in their forecasts. They're doing pretty well on both up cycles and down cycles. We had a pretty long period over um, the summer where different regions were trading off on who was being problematic, but the national picture as a whole was pretty flat. Uh, and you, there you can really see some teams are always high, some teams are always low. It's a little harder to see now that we're in this big upward spike, and especially with all the data anomalies around the holidays. But, um, but anyway, so yeah, I think it's really it's it's really tough to to uh, take the smaller factors, and um, you know, I just think by the time you factor those in, you've made a lot of assumptions, and you make assumptions about what the effectiveness is and where it's gonna be used and how long it takes to roll it out. And um, by the time you do all that, the, I think whatever additional accuracy is in there has just gotten lost in the, in the error bars on the assumptions. Are you open for questions? Uh, I'm sure, go right ahead. There are a couple stacking up in the chat, but go right ahead first. My question is, in your model, do you, do you use the standard epidemiological model of a reproduction rate? And if you do, where do you get that? And if you don't, why do you avoid that model? Yeah, I definitely do not. Um, I have zero epidemiological background. I have a background mostly in software estimation. Uh, I've written a book on software estimation, been interested in the topic for like 30 years now. Um, but one of the, the truisms about software estimation is that most of the best estimation techniques have nothing to do with software. And so that's kind of why I started thinking that this might apply to the pandemic back in the April, May timeframe. And uh, uh, the technique in, in my world, the technique I'm using is called proxy based estimation. So basically you have some quantity that you're interested in estimating. You can't directly estimate that, but you know there's a relationship to some other quantity that you can count or measure in some way. So that other quantity is the proxy for the quantity that you care about. So for my approach, positive tests are the proxy for deaths and, uh, and then with a, a lag inserted. And, and that's really it. Um, you know, there definitely are, the majority of the teams uh, are trying to use something kind of sort of like SEIR uh, models or some other kind of epidemiological model. 
Uh, but it's been really interesting to me to see that those aren't the teams that are producing the accurate forecasts. You know, I, I think there's certainly a, a good argument to be made that as time goes by, if we're living with COVID-19 for some you know, indeterminate number of years, that what they're doing is building a better infrastructure than what I'm doing or what uh, the other individuals who are using simpler models are doing. Uh, but at present, uh, those models don't seem to be bearing anywhere near as much fruit. I'm gonna take a couple of questions from the chat. Uh, why does the accuracy of the forecast fall off after four weeks? And is there any way to extend that accuracy? Yeah, so that, you know, that's not a topic I've looked at, but it's a topic that the team at Reich Labs has looked at quite a bit. And um, first of all, let me just say, it's really clear the accuracy drops off a lot after four weeks. Um, and it continues to drop off, to drop off the further out you go. Uh, mostly, I think it drops off because uh, if I think of it in terms of proxy-based um, estimation, and I've got a two week lag between when people are tested and when some of those people die, that's it, it's two weeks. I'm, I'm kind of done with my proxy at that point. It doesn't go any further out. Uh, and so in my approach, I basically take the two weeks and then I just trend that, which I think is what other teams are doing too, uh, some of them anyway. And so I can trend that out for um, basically what I do, which <laughs> is, pretty out of step with what some of the other teams are doing is I trend it out for the third week. And then I have what I call a rational actor assumption for the fourth week, which is that uh, by the time you get three weeks into a bad situation, the states will take some kind of action if they're having a bad situation to try to, to uh, uh, bring it back down. But if it's a good situation, they'll try to keep it good. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'd say a much more common assumption is whichever direction the line's going, it's gonna keep going. Mm -hmm. Uh, my my uh, lines tend to stand out in the group calls because my tend to go up and then go down in the fourth week. But um, I think you know I, I have a I have a for the longer term forecast the four week forecast my accuracy has been as good as any of the other teams I think so uh, that forecast that that approach seems to be working. Thanks. Uh, do you have an estimate of how many people have already been infected with COVID in the United States versus what has been reported in the U.S.? Yeah, I absolutely do. Um, and uh, um, so I'm just um, pulling up my chart on this. Um, so um, I don't know. Shall I show the chart? I can do a state by state chart. Yeah. We'd love it. Yeah. Um, I'll just show this whole screen in case anybody wants to ask any other question I happen to have data for. Um, so um, this is my state-by-state -state forecast. Overall for the US, I think it's somewhere between 21 and 33% of people who have been infected. Um, am I actually sharing that yet? I think I'm not uh, actually now sharing it yet. Now it's time to go. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, um, yeah, so in, in my approach, because I, I think it's important to represent the uncertainty, the dark blue bar, part of the bar is represents what I see as the minimum infected in each state and the lighter blue bar represents the, the possible number of infected in each state. So I've got North Dakota as the highest possibly infected percentage, South Dakota not too far behind. Um, uh, New Jersey is definitely up there, uh, and New York, which, you know, for a long time, New York was sticking up above everybody else, but over the summer, that changed. Massachusetts has just been one that, you know, they've just had a bunch of kind of smaller scale resurgences that haven't, I think, ever been the worst in the country, but they've kind of been in that, like, second tier repeatedly, so they've accumulated a lot over time. On a percentage basis, California is not super high, but um, you know the state is so populous. Yeah, you know, one of the th interesting things about this is my knowledge of geography now is so much better than it was a year ago, and demographics across the U.S. So, like you know, California with 40 million people has vastly more people than any other state in the U.S. I didn't realize California had twice as many people as New York, but uh, 
you know, relatively low percentage in California is still an awful lot of people. Um, so anyway, that's the way it looks to me. And I would, I would put the likely number right in the middle of that, uh, right in the middle of that range. So around 27%, something like that. And in terms of the, the number that that works out to, um, as long as I'm sharing my screen here. So there's, this chart gives the, the raw number. Oops. Um, so, you know, around 80 to 90 million infected likely. And I mean, in general, this is good news, I think, right? Because these are people who actually may have some kind of herd immunity or be contributing some kind of herd immunity. That's one thing I do really don't see uh, discussed very much with all the vaccine rollouts is, okay, we're hoping to get herd immunity from the vaccine, but you know, I think there's a reasonable chance that we as a country have higher, a higher baseline for achieving herd immunity than we think we do just because there's been this, such a fixation on positive tests instead of trying to talk about the number of cases that you know, we say you know, the news is always about how many positive tests we've had. And I think it's funny because that's being presented as though it's a dramatic number. I think the real number is actually far more dramatic but in the long run, it's actually better news because we've got, you know, maybe somewhere between a quarter and a third of the population that's that's already had it and potentially already has antibodies and has some immunity to it. So, um, fascinating. Molly, did you have a question? No, just checking. <laughs> Uh, let's see, we've got another one in the chat from Debbie Taves. I see maps that have seven and 14 day moving averages for new, new cases for counties or states. Do you think it's useful for people to follow those trends for their state or county? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, the reason that they have seven day and 14 day moving averages is because of that days of the week issue. Uh, and I, I see various graphs where people, where they'll say that they're smoothing on a three-day basis or five-day basis. It doesn't really work in this instance because we've got this dramatic difference uh, in reporting based on what day of the week we're talking about. So the smoothing really has to be done on a, the basis of multiple of seven. So those are the right numbers, seven days or 14 days. Um, and, uh, uh, and that's why I like the news report last week of 4,000 deaths in one day isn't isn't really true because it's uh, it's just taking a reporting anomaly essentially where we're reporting a lot more on one day. So yeah, the maps that have seven and fourteen day moving averages, um, I think they're useful to a point. I mean, we're at a we're at essentially at a point in the country where it almost doesn't really matter what the map says at this point. The action is going to be about the same, uh, and uh, you know I think the. The good news is it looks like we've seen some light at the end of the tunnel, although it seems, you know, I don't think Washington State even has a date for people my age to be vaccinated yet, and the schedule goes out into the summer, but there's no no space in that calendar for, for my age group yet. Um, so the light of the tunnel is pretty far out there, but um, um, Anyway, yeah, so I mean, I guess just as a way of kind of keeping track, uh, on my website, I have state level um, scorecards, essentially, or dashboards. Uh, I put those together in the first place because I didn't think the simplistic numbers on their own were super, super meaningful, but I haven't tried to do anything at the county level. And the, the end game here is very much, re you know, at the small region, county, you know, and eventually maybe even like neighborhoods. So. Um, Washington State has really large counties geographically. You know, some of the eastern states have really, really, really small counties by Washington State standards. So, county level data is kind of interesting just for that reason that what we think a county is versus what Connecticut thinks a county is are, you know, vastly different things. And um, so, um, anyway, yeah, it certainly doesn't hurt anything and probably helps. I'm losing your audio. Uh, is this better? Not really. Nancy, would you like to take over? 
and read the question in the chat. And have you found any patterns in your analysis that might help states reduce their case numbers? That, you know, that really hasn't been my focus. Um, and I, I don't have anything to add beyond what probably everybody who's interested enough to attend this has already read on their own. So um, I, I, I think I will, I will pass on that question. Some states are reporting confirmed and probable cases. Where, will there be a problem of double reporting? <laughs> uh, the problem is going to be that 51 states, counting BC as a state, are going to have different standards for what counts as confirmed and what counts as probable. So all that's going to do is add additional variability into the variability we already have in reporting at the state level. Um, yeah, I. Um, the idea that each, so I mean, I just went through my own, a, a brief discussion of my own analysis of, of how I get to a probable number of cases. So basically we're gonna have 50 states doing that in 50 different ways uh, to come up with their number of probable cases. And uh, from, my, from my vantage point, I'm just gonna ignore the probable cases because um, I don't think it helps. It doesn't help what I'm doing to have the, those guesses made 50 different ways. And you know, some of the states I'm sure will do a great job and will be really good. And I think, and I'm sure some of the states will do a really bad job. You know, we've had some in the, there have been a number of studies of antibody tests where they take the, they do a kind of some kind of sampling of antibody test results and then try to extrapolate the number of people who are infected in the area from the number of people who, who test positive in the antibody tests. And the variability on those is just crazy. Uh, where, uh, and, and the methodologies are, are pretty goofy too. Like, you know, one of the, one of the more high profile studies takes people who are already sick and coming in to get a blood draw and then saying, okay, we're going to use those as a representative sample of the population overall. It's like, really people who are sick enough to go in for a blood draw are representative. That doesn't, that doesn't make sense to me. And then, and then the population or the, the percentage of people uh, that are supposedly positive based on uh, the, these kind of random samples of, of antibodies from randomly drawn blood samples. If you look at them state by state and you compare it to anybody's numbers on what the probable infections are, they're just, they're just very wildly. So anyway, uh, I, I just don't think that's helpful. I certainly see why states want to do it. They think they should want to do it, but um, and it, it probably is helpful for them, but it's just not, it's not helpful for somebody doing what, what I'm doing. Uh, but we'll see. I'm sure some of the other modeling teams will probably look seriously at that data and try to do something with it. Thank you, Steve. Uh, that's the last question in the chat. Are there any other questions um, you'd like to unmute and um, just go ahead? I'll, I'll jump in with one. Um, my name's Justin and I work at Kinza. And uh, for those of you who might not be familiar, we're a public health company and we have a smart thermometer that connects with an app. Um, it was founded uh, about eight years ago and kind of made it new for itself by doing uh, disease uh, surveillance and monitoring for seasonal flu. Um, and it's really taken off this year with COVID as we've found that we've actually been able to best some of the CDC's forecast um, mostly because we're dealing with pre-healthcare system data. So we have 2 million smart thermometers around the country and we're able to see early time illness pop up because we're getting that data in real time before reporting happens. So someone gets sick, goes to the doctor a few days later, gets a test a few days later, pass. So those results are all kind of, you know, lagging indicators. And we're, we're finding that we're getting, you know, better forecasts because we're dealing with real time uh, pre-healthcare system data. And so Steve, I'm I'm wondering what your thoughts are on, um, you know, biometric uh, measurements to kind of improve forecasting curves where you see um, a lot of, um, you know, the teams doing forecasting, including the CDC and other institutions relying more on data like ours, um, which we're finding is, is a big advantage in doing long lead forecasting. 
Yeah. So um, my jokey response is I think there's like a dystopian future vision where we all have to wear thermometer strips on our foreheads. And, you know, if it's the wrong color, then people shun us or we get you know, arrested or whatnot. Um, but the non-jokey response is, I, you know, I do think that kind of thing is helpful. Uh, I mean, not clearly not everyone who has a temperature has, um, has uh, COVID. Uh, but, you know, you could, I'm sure you have developed data already that says, you know, there's some percentage of people who have temperatures who have COVID. And so getting that information earlier, if you're able to say, hey, look, you know, we've got, um, you know, Ferry County in Washington State has a extra high percentage of people whose temperatures suddenly started going up. You know, the idea that you could notify people in Ferry County and say, hey, look, we're starting to see what looks like it might be a surge in your area. Um, you know, the end game here has to be identifying, I mean, the end game here, vaccination aside, uh, has to be identifying the people who have, who are infected before they're contagious, or at least a high percentage of them before they're contagious. So the kind of thing you're describing, you know, sounds like it would, would uh, narrow that gap and, and could be pretty helpful. Hi, Steve. Uh, I know that there were some states that were tracking people who died with COVID versus people who died of COVID. Yeah. Is that something that's going to become nationwide, potentially? I believe Colorado was doing it and, uh, and maybe possibly some other states. Well, I think we've already seen that. I think we've already seen the full cycle of that. Uh, you know, originally, I think there was guidelines about um, recording everyone with and states interpreted that in various ways or adhered to it in various ways. Um, and then, you know, there were some extreme examples of, you know, somebody who drowned and, and was counted. And back in June, Washington state took, I forget if it was 17 or 19, but we had 17 or 19 deaths, something like that, that uh, we went back and looked at and said, no, no, no. Yeah, these were with, but there's just, it's ridiculous to count them. And so we had, we had a week where we reported negative deaths from coronavirus. So that creates some interesting math for your forecasting as well. Um, and we've had others that happen in other states. Pennsylvania did that a couple of times where they had negative deaths. And, um, you know, so that's just, that's been, that's been part of the background noise for, for several months. Um, and the thing that's, you know, what really would have been nice is if all the states did it like the same week. Um, but, Instead, it's basically is some you know trickle of surprises that come out week after week in in various states, and so um, you know I think Oregon had an issue uh, a couple of weeks ago that was kind of similar to that. And um, anyway, uh, it just seems to keep happening over and over. Thank you. You Steve, know, I will say um, if if you haven't looked at the um, on the the CDC website for influenza. They've got a lot of really interesting material, I think, on what they do to figure out what the number of actual influenza deaths is each year, because the, the death certificate count and the ultimate CDC count are vastly different. And if you read the website, what it says, and I don't know anything other than what's on the website, but they've got a lot of documents and so on. They talk about the fact that uh, the death certificates tend to over... Um, attribute pneumonia as the cause of death. And so they have a fairly elaborate process for going back and reviewing uh, the pneumonia numbers and essentially uh, changing the attribution to, um, to uh, uh, influenza. And so prior to the COVID-19, they were tracking pneumonia and influenza as a, as a group number, which kind of makes sense because they're saying it's really hard to tell which is which. So there's value in tracking them in aggregate. And of course, now they're tracking pneumonia, influenza, and COVID as a group. Uh, and so, you know, it's easily conceivable that that's the grouping going forward, uh, just because it, it may be very difficult to say. And, you know, we've had numerous uh, debates about this. If somebody has pneumonia and influenza and COVID and they die, you know, what do you attribute it to? And, and uh, you know, I think there, there are guidelines for that, but um, it seems to be uh, a little bit in flux as well. So, uh, you know, for what I'm doing, 
the approach that I'm using is not so sensitive to what the rules are. It's more sensitive to if they change. And uh, so if they if they stay consistent, it's not really going to affect my ability to do forecasts. But you know these 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 uh, kind of unexpected changes, especially if they happen in bigger states. Um, so New York, New Jersey. You know, New Jersey when they backfilled 3,500 deaths on one day, that was enough to mess up national forecasting for a couple of weeks. You know, not just New Jersey, but the whole country. Thank you, Steve. Uh, a couple more questions in the chat. Bob Lee states, the news is reporting a record number of deaths today, about 4,300. If the data on Wednesday is overreported by 32%, then the actual number is more like 3,300. Yep, I think that's right. Um, you know, we're, we're in a grim period. There's no question about it. Uh, you know, I mean, in a way, it's you know, in a way, I kind of hate splitting hairs over whether it's 3,200 or 3,300 or 4,300. You know, it's, it's, we're not in a good, good state right now, no matter how you, how you slice it. But, you know, in terms of, are we really hitting 4,300? You know, no, that's a reporting number, not a, an actual number, almost, almost certainly. Um, you know, the other thing that's happening is, uh, I, I think we're done with this now, but if this were, if we were talking about this last week, and certainly the week before, then we would be talking about how many of those are actually backfill from what got missed um, over New Year's. And uh, same thing for, well, the week, I, the week between Christmas and New Year's, if those holidays weren't a week apart, I think we would expect to see a bunch of backfilling from Christmas into the New Year's week. I think what we saw instead was it was really dragged out or spread out over the week for over the, at least the two weeks from um, Christmas to a full week after after New Year's, and it's unclear if it spread out into uh, last week at all. But at this point, we really should be done with that backfilling. So, so all we're talking about is the weekly variation. We're not not also talking about um, uh, any of the holiday backfill. And from a forecasting point of view, I'm really glad we don't have any big holidays for a few months. <laughs> um, those have been disruptive. I suppose, you know, the other interesting dynamic that we saw, which I don't know if everybody everybody noticed, but um, in the week running up to Thanksgiving, really 10 days or so running up to Thanksgiving, there was an enormous spike in positive tests, but there was an even bigger spike in total tests. And uh, so um, that was pretty easy to interpret at the time as saying, Lots of people are getting tested prior to trying to get together with family over Thanksgiving. And that actually seemed like a reasonable, reasonably good idea. You know, it was a little bit of a challenge because the raw number of positive tests was high. So there were reports around that week of hitting all time highs. But yeah, we were, you know, we were running way higher total tests too. So uh, the numbers were increasing a little bit, but nowhere near as much as it looked like they were increasing. Um, and then the thing that I think didn't work out so well is that we didn't see that same kind of run up in the week before Christmas. And anecdotally, I heard people say things like, well, I just got tested the week before Thanksgiving. And, you know, that's basically meaningless. So, um, you know, hopefully we're not going to see, uh, see be bit too much by that. Thank you. Uh, here's a question from L. Some jurisdictions are testing sewage. Opinion? Yeah, I haven't looked at that a lot, but I think it's actually kind of similar. I, my response would essentially be the same as it was to Justin, which is if you can narrow down to, you know, a neighborhood or a city uh, by testing sewage, I think that seems like a really good step. So, you know, when I first heard about it several months ago, you're just like, what? But um, you know, it, it definitely seems like there's, there's some, some there there. So, yeah. Here's a question from Leslie Atkins. Do you know which forecasts are used in news reports? It seemed that early on that IHME was used most often and from your information, it is not one of the most reliable forecasts. No, I would go further and say, I think IHME is terrible. 
um, I think they've been they've been in the bottom half repeatedly in at least with their point forecasts at the national level and the state level. In the last couple months, their prediction interval forecasts have gotten better, and they're actually now doing you know often in the top third to a quarter with their state level prediction intervals. But they have just been miserably bad, and they've been alarmist. And they're definitely the group I was thinking about early in the talk when I said it seemed like their goal. What seemed to me like their goal was to instill panic. And you know, like the they had a forecast that came out uh, around Labor Day, where they said that their most likely forecast was that 410,000 people were going to die by January 1st. And doing really simple math on how many deaths had occurred up to that point and how many were going to have to occur every day after that point to get to that level by January 1st, we were going to have to beat the daily high, like, you know, 57 days in a row or something like that uh, to, to hit that number. And, and, and the really stupid thing about that was they, they published their 410,000 number as their most likely number. They published a 95% prediction interval around that number. Within two weeks, reality was outside of their 95% prediction interval. So it only took two weeks for reality to say, no, this is just so far off, um, it's not credible. But in the meantime, they made a big news splash over Labor Day weekend. It got quoted on CNN and various other places. I think clearly IHME has gotten more coverage than any other forecast group, possibly even more coverage than the CDC. Uh, and I don't, I think they must just have a really good publicist because their forecasts are not, not accurate and they haven't been accurate for a long time. There was a paper published back in May or June that looked at their 95% prediction intervals and said that they were missing like 45% of their 95% prediction intervals back then. So it's not like they used to be good and became bad. They've been bad the whole time. So, um, and I think I wrote an article on this on Medium that you can read if you're interested. But to me, I think this is one of, the, you know, is, is basically an example of what happens when scientists stop being scientists and start being advocates. I think that their goal is to get people to practice social distancing and wear masks, but they're doing it by exaggerating uh, what they really believe in. It wouldn't have bothered me if they had said, look, you know, our model says there's a chance we could have 410,000 people die by the end of the year, but that's not what they said. They said their most likely forecast was 410,000. And, you know, there was a way to get to 410,000 and we didn't get, as it turned out, you know, we got um, basically 55% of the, of the way there based on their forecast. But, you know, being off by 45% on your most likely forecast is a really high margin of error and being outside your 95% prediction range after two weeks on a four month forecast is, uh, is not good either. So I, I'm frustrated by IHME, as you can no doubt tell. Uh, there are teams that are doing better job. The ensemble model is doing a way better job. And, uh, and so the coverage of IHME has been, I think, has not been helpful. Uh, it's alarmed people excessively. I mean, we have plenty to be alarmed about. We don't need to exaggerate it. There's one last comment in the chat and we'll use it as our last uh, question. Um, Emily Luthra provided a URL, healthweather.us. Um, Emily, is there anything you wanted to add to that? I see you're still with us. Oh, no, I was just including the, um, that was uh, the, someone who works at Kinza came on and um, that's the site that they early on reported basically temperatures um, across the U.S. as a way to track. And so I was just sharing the link for people who weren't familiar with Kinza. This is uh, uh, the website for them. Great, thank you. Thanks for adding that. I, I didn't uh, put you up to that, but that, that is our, our data website. And we, um, can do, we do our forecast down to the zip code level uh, in cities and to the county level in, in more rural areas um, based on our thermometer density in those populations. Um, right now, there's a, a new feature that we launched, launched. It's a risk score, essentially. We look at um, our, our predicted uh, trajectory of cases and compare that with what case levels are um, to give uh, essentially a risk score. 
right now, as we've discussed, it's very high everywhere. So it's not quite as useful at this point in the pandemic as it has been earlier on, but still interesting. Okay, there is one more uh, in the chat. When the diagram was shown, Washington, whoops, Washington State wasn't visible. Is it possible to show the diagram again for Washington State with the COVID cases? Yeah, sure. Um, let me share my screen. So I don't know, um, I, I guess I won't enlarge the window in case the Washington was getting maybe cut off uh, on the edge of the screen. Can you see Washington now? In Washington has consistently been, uh, had one of the lowest infection rates in the country. Um, one of the charts that you can find on my website that, but that I, I have really paid a lot of attention to is this one. Um, this, this is definitely based on positive tests, so it doesn't mean the same thing now that it meant back in, in April, but this, is, this one is arranged geographically from east to west, or rather from west to east, left to right, and so over the course of the pandemic, it's been a really useful tool for looking at where their, the outbreak is clustering, and it's made a lot easier, like early on back in uh, April, May, June, it was so clear that even though the pandemic was being treated as a national issue, it was really a Northeast corridor issue. There was a 400 mile long corridor, 75 miles wide, that basically went from Boston to Washington DC that accounted for like 70, 75% of the total deaths of the pandemic. Um, and you could easily see that in this representation, uh, but most of, most of the representations are presented alphabetically or whatnot, so it's a little bit harder to see. But you can see Washington over here on the left side. Um, you know we're we're doing quite well compared to almost every other place in the country. You know Vermont has never really had much of a problem, and they're still low. Hawaii is back to being in in better shape. Oregon Oregon's kind of been up and down, but they're doing okay now. Um, you know North Dakota, it's good to see them at that level after uh, what they've been through. Um, but you know seeing Arizona up here taken off again, not good. California, not good. You know, Arkansas, Oklahoma, you know, and then the Northeastern states, Rhode Island. Rhode Island has seemed like it kind of moves a little bit quicker, maybe just because the numbers are smaller and they move quicker. I don't know, but um, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, you know, what we really don't want to see is like New York and New Jersey taken off again, but um, you know, and then Texas somewhere, where did Texas go over here? Yeah. So, you know, and then Florida, uh, Florida is kind of, so the way this chart works is, um, yellow indicates an increase over the last week to two weeks and green indicates a decrease, uh, in the per capita tests over the last week to two weeks. You can see Alaska is the only state that has any green at all. And the solid line represents the seven days prior to, basically the, the, the marker is for the last seven days. The solid part of the line is for the seven days before that. And then the hollow part of the line is for the seven days before that. And so it gives you an ability to see kind of what the, what the trend is. So like Arizona, you know, no part of that looks good. Um, you know, they were way down here uh, 21 days ago and then they shot up quickly. It looks like they shot up a little bit slower, not a lot. Same thing for Oklahoma. You know, that does not look like a good picture. Arkansas is a little better because they moved up um, for 21 to 14 days ago. There's no solid yellow showing, so they didn't move up. They've been basically stable for a week, so there's some chance they'll start coming back down. But anyway, this has been an interesting chart. I think uh, there's a lot in there if you, if you know how to interpret it. Well, with that, I believe we'll wrap it up. And I want to thank Steve for um, taking the time to share this with us as fascinating information. Uh, I also want to thank Sarah Hogan, who is a colleague and a development officer, and she brought Steve to our attention. And so, Sarah, thank you for that. And Jennifer uh, Northam for all of her work putting this together. So um, this was recorded. Um, when the recording is posted, we will send out an email um, to all of you and um, then you can um, watch it again.
So thank you so much. Uh, have a great evening and take care. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Steve. Thank you.